This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with uh, Energy in America. And this time, uh, Max Pizier is joining us. And he's with EPRINC, the Energy Policy Research Think Tank in Washington. And uh, we're going to talk with Max about gasoline prices and some related U.S. policy initiatives happening right now. Welcome back to the show, Max. Nice to see your smiling face. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for having me. So, you know, you and EPRINC, uh, you follow gas prices. And we all right. ought to follow gas prices because the fact is that most of our gra ground transportation is still in gas prices, especially including here in Hawaii. Um, and, uh, you know, I heard that gas prices went up. So I'm wondering, you know, what the market is like right now, uh, both in Hawaii and the mainland and elsewhere in the world, and why? Have you got a handle um, on that? You know, I, I've got a bit of a handle on that. I, um, obviously, uh, the biggest uh, influencer on transportation fuels, gasoline in particular, uh, are, are the price, are the cost of feedstocks. That's crude oil. The things that are critically affecting crude oil right now are um, uh, the diminution of supply. And that's, uh, to put it uh, gently, in Venezuela in particular, and then uh, the oncoming sanctions uh, in Iran. The, so you're moving, you're removing barrels from uh, uh, from the supply side, uh, and consequently you're constricting uh, the supply-demand balance, and that that's affecting gasoline prices. So. Since May, we've seen uh, an overall appreciation of gasoline prices uh, on the wholesale level to about $2. Um, and then depending where you are regionally, Hawaii, California, uh, Texas, to uh, close to $3 and, and places like New York State or Texas and uh, $3.50 uh, for regular gas. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me regular gasoline in, in uh, uh, California and, I assume, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Hawaii. Hawaii probably tracks California fairly closely. Mm -hmm. um, since the end of August, uh, you, you had uh, the usual se seasonality uh, dip kick in, which means uh, summer uh, de demand came off, and you're seeing a flattening in prices on account of that. You're not seeing uh, uh, the same steepness in demand as you saw over the course of the summer. Mm. But You'll probably see elevated prices as long as you have a problem with uh, Venezuela and uh, a problem with Iran. Yeah. So, uh, so what does a barrel of oil cost these days? Well, um, U.S. I think is uh, uh, it, it bounces around seventy U.S. Uh, West Texas Intermediate and Brent, um, which sets the standard for Atlantic Basin trade, uh, bounces between seventy-five and eighty, uh, and that. And that impl uh, implies uh, gasoline prices of um, in the lower 48 of uh, between 250 and 3, and in California and Hawaii between 3 and 350. Mm. Why the difference? Well, I think well in California in particular, it's, it's because of their uh, onerous uh, uh, fuel standards. Back in the uh, 70s and 80s, they decided to. Uh, um, legislatively mandate their own formulation of gasoline. So only the refiners within the state of California can produce uh, that, that uh, formulation of gasoline, and it uh, requires fairly expensive components relative to, uh, to other places. I assume in the context of Hawaii, it's, it's a matter of location. Uh, the freight cost of getting crude oil to Hawaii and then uh, the refining cost. Uh, the fact it, it's a location factor. What about low sulfur? Low sulfur uh, oil is where is that in price? Low sulfur oil. Well, um, I I don't have a, a, a direct handle on that. In two weeks ago, when we discussed uh, uh, the imminent IMO 2020 sulfur uh, regulation uh, set to go into effect in 2020. Um, that's going to affect a global recalibration in prices. You're going to see uh, high sulfur. You're going to, there's going to be a requirement to move 2 million barrels of 
high sulfur fuel oil into a low sulfur range. That means uh, refiners are going to have to, uh, the capacity utilization is going to have to increase, uh, uh, and you're going to have to move hydrocarbon molecules out of certain ranges like gasoline, like diesel, into the ranges that are compatible for bunker fuels. Mm. Uh, and that, 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 that right away creates uh, a certain amount of chaos and um, price volatility and probably uh, increased prices for uh, gasoline. Yeah, we always, we always uh, think about, worry about LSO in Hawaii because that's what they use for a good part, if not most of the generated um, electrical power out here. And our, right. our, our systems require it. And, um, and although I, there are benefits, I suppose, to using low sulfur low sulfur oil, um, it's more expensive generally. Yeah. Oh, I, I, absolutely. It's going to be, there's going to be a 50% hike. That's what's expected on January 1st, 2020. Yeah. Um, and given that uh, um, Hawaii, as I understand it, is 70% reliant on, uh, on, on fuel oil for power generation, that will impact electricity prices at the wholesale level. Yeah. So uh, what about the, you know, the trouble in the Middle East? Uh, you know, I'm not sure you could yet say that uh, Saudi Arabia and the uh, Khashoggi's disappearance, dismemberment and death, um, you know, is going to affect oil prices. But I wonder about our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Uh, Trump is under some pressure now about trying to make them, you know, tell us what happened. Uh, right. And uh, Mike Pompeo gave them some time this morning. He said that they could do an investigation. Gee, this sounds like the, uh, you know, the Senate Judiciary Committee investigation. Um, right. They can do an investigation on what happens. Uh, what I find interesting is that the investigation is going to be made more difficult by the fact that, um, that the uh, Saudi uh, embassy where this uh, supposedly happened was immediately repainted inside uh, before the, uh, before the uh, investigative authorities from Turkey got there. So they, whatever evidence there was has been repainted. And uh, this is right. a, kind of a problem. And anyway, I guess my question, I'm wondering, but my question right. is, um, you know, when you get to the end of it and our relationship with them is affected somehow, I mean, I assume there'll be some effect here because, right. you know, the story is pretty, pretty bad. Um, right. w will that affect oil? W will this kind of, you know, disruption in international relations uh, uh, affect the price of oil? Um, I myself haven't thought it through, but I, I, I was reading stories uh, uh, this afternoon and this evening saying that uh, because pressure uh, is exerted on Saudi Arabia, they might withhold uh, barrels from uh, global markets. That might cause prices to spike. But m my sense is, is that um, it's, uh, they don't hold the keys to the kingdom, speaking colloquially, in the sense that uh, they no longer control the oil markets as they did back in the 1980s. Uh, we now have uh, uh, burgeoning production in the United States, in Texas in particular, but also in North Dakota. Um, I think also uh, Russia would like to get more barrels out on, um, into the market. Mm. So whatever they might withhold, um, you, you have ample supply elsewhere. Uh, that could uh, be, deliver mm -hmm. be delivered into the market. So, you know, and again, referring back to my first point, I, uh, Venezuela and the Iranian sanctions are the ones that, that are really constricting uh, the markets uh, in particular. And if Saudis pull barrels off, and I don't understand the motivation there because they need the money, uh, if, but if they do pull barrels off or people... Uh, uh, sovereignties decide that uh, uh, they want to embargo uh, Saudi barrels. Um, there's a, there's expanding supply from the United States. There's and Russia would like to get uh, its supply into the markets. Sure. So we shouldn't be too concerned. What about what about OPEC? I I thought I read <coughs> that um, there was a certain amount of pressure on OPEC to um, you know be more what am I say liberal in terms of uh, providing supply. What 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 are the politics, the international politics around OPEC these days? Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not, my strength isn't in the upstream, but um, what, generally the, uh, uh, the issue with OPEC is uh, uh, 
quota discipline, and um, they pursue uh, quota discipline in order to raise prices. But once prices reach a certain particular level, the uh, member uh, constituencies of OPEC want to sell into those high prices, and that's where you begin to um, uh, the quota discipline begins to break down. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry, I have a bad cough, but. That's that's the issue that I see in, in this particular uh, you know in, in in this particular context with Iranian sanctions, uh, yeah, Venezuela, uh, some sort of policy action against Saudi Arabia, uh, perhaps not on the part of the United States but on the part of other countries. It's uh, I, yeah I'm, at at eighty ninety dollars I, I would see discipline breaking down on the part of OPEC members. And other constituencies would dearly want to sell into this market. Mm -hmm. um, okay, what what uh, what policy is, is the Trump uh, administration uh, presenting to uh, international oil these days that might affect the market going forward? Uh, before we started, you spoke about a conference that you have attended recently, and mm -hmm. you spoke about action taken in Congress. Uh, can we talk about the, uh, those policy considerations? Sure. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, last week I was in London. Uh, I attended a biofuels conference. I was there both as a panelist uh, uh, and I also chaired a roundtable. Uh, the panel was on political will for biofuels, for ethanol in particular, and uh, the roundtable was uh, a discussion of the potential of growth uh, for ethanol in U.S. markets. Um, the general back that I gave on this was is that uh, there are three pillars for um, biofuels and new markets. Uh, the first one, obviously, is the renewable fuel standard. Uh, in the case of Hawaii, uh, uh, Hawaii judiciously opted out of it, I think, in 2015. Um, but it's still, it, it's, it's fine that it opted out, but all these policies might play in such a way that um, Hawaii might still as being uh, a constituent of, of, of the United States might still uh, be affected by this. So, but, but I'm trying to I'm trying to give you a preview of, of coming interactions. Yeah, sure. I, still, I still need to give you a, uh, the baseline. So um, the first one is the renewable fuel standard. Uh, but what predicated the <laughs> renewable fuel standard was uh, a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, not a particularly great one, in my opinion, but it was uh, the uh, title. Massachusetts versus EPA, it was uh, decided uh, on a four to three basis uh, in 2007, and it made the determination that greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in particular, were pollutants. And this gave, gave EPA the authority to regulate things like ethanol, uh, things such as ethanol, um, and, and to make other kinds of determinations about transportation fuels. Uh, the third pillar is, is something known as corporate average fuel economy standards, CAFE standards. Uh, so they were originated in, 19, in the mid-1970s. Uh, they'd gone through various periods. But when the Obama administration came into uh, into power, um, they fortified uh, the CAFE standards and gave them three phases. The third phase is particular, uh, particularly onerous. And... Um, the automobile manufacturers have to really ramp, uh, really increase fuel efficiency, and they can do it one of two ways. They can either do it through higher octane engines, or they can do it through uh, electrification. Um, so we're kind of at that juncture, um, and that, that, that's what I was uh, presenting at the uh, at the conference in Europe, in London. Uh, I was saying, you uh, know, um, if we're at the situation where we have to make certain kinds of decisions about do we continue with the internal combustion engine and transportation fuels, or do we move into an era of electrification? Mm -hmm. um, what has been taking place in Washington is uh, fairly active deliberations between uh, constituencies uh, among auto manufacturers tied to constituencies in the refining uh, in refining and transportation fuel production. Uh, they've tried to bring the uh, the biofuel people to the table. 
some have listened, some, some have been, uh, uh, but others, others have uh, not participated. But the point is, is that uh, it's an attempt to move to a higher octane standard, a 95 rod, uh, as it's known. And uh, in that way, you could still continue production of motor vehicles with internal combustion engines. Uh, you could increase fuel efficiency. Um, and you would have uh, a potential for biofuels, in particular ethanol, uh, to be uh, blended in for higher octane purposes. Uh, I mentioned uh, this, this uh, uh, Supreme Court decision and its determination on carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. That gave the rationale for higher ethanol blending because it has 20% uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions throughout its whole uh, production supply chain life cycle. But the concerns here have fallen away from, uh, at least in the Congress, nobody's discussing, uh, at least in, these administra in this administration and um, in the Republican controlled uh, legislatures, uh, what to do about greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the discussion is, is, if we're going to a higher octane engine, what can give us the octane? So there's two sources. Uh, one is the re uh, certain refining processes produce something known as reformants. Uh, they, they have a considerable amount of octane, but it's relatively costly to add more reforming capacity to, to refiners, to, to, refining, uh, to refiners, uh, refineries, apologies. Uh, ethanol, in, um, in its... Uh, as, 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 as controversial as it is, has high octane content. And um, while biorefineries themselves are not particularly cheap um, when compared to reformers at refineries, they're, uh, they can be quickly implemented. There's a huge oversupply of corn and the, uh, ethanol right now priced against the uh, um, gasoline at the wholesale level is very cheap. Dollar fifty versus dollar twenty. Dollar twenty-four a gallon of ethanol at the wholesale level. So, um, at the end the, of the day, there's a bill um, right. or hearings going on in the House um, Energy Committee, no, and that right. bill is going to have a big effect on exactly what this country does going forward in terms of. Uh, the, the use of uh, the use of octane fuel and or elect electrification um, exactly and, and so max I want to take a short break a minute sure and uh, we come back uh, Max Pizier, we're gonna we're gonna discuss uh, what the what the the pressures are on that committee who wants what what the lobbyists are saying and demanding what the constituents want and therefore we can make some prognostications about how it will go in a highly political, highly polarized Congress. You know, it wasn't only polarized in judiciary, it's polarized in energy too. We'll be right Absolutely. back after this break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread and kissed them all soundly and put them to bed. Hunger is a story we can end. End it at feedingamerica.org. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just gonna scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're examining energy in America with Max Pizier, uh, and he is with ePrink in Washington, D.C., and we're talking about uh, a little politics now, we're talking about some uh, some 
uh, investigations and hearings going on in the House Energy Committee uh, having to do with whether we continue to use uh, fossil fuel for automobile transportation or whether we, um, we, we sort of migrate more to electrification is a big question. So what, what, are the, what, what is going on in the House uh, Energy Committee, Max? Um, well, there, there's been a considerable amount of activity in this particular session. Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> uh, there is a subcommittee of the House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, called the Environment Subcommittee. It is chaired by um, Illinois Congressman John Shimkus. Uh, he is from, uh, I think it's the 12th, it's, it's not, you don't have to run for your maps, I'll describe the district in a second, but it's 12th district, I think, uh, uh, of, of, of the state of Illinois. Uh, he is in, in kind of a strange triangle. He's got an awful lot of cropland, an awful lot of corn farmers, but um, he, he's from Collinsville, which is on the western side of the state. So he has a lot of, uh, uh, there's a refinery close by in Wood River, Illinois, 200, large, large refinery. Uh, so a lot of those workers live within his district. So that's, that's tax dollars there. And then uh, Marathon Petroleum has a refinery in Robinson, Illinois, closer to the Wabash River. Uh, so, so he has both interests within his own jurisdiction. And uh, I'm sure they, they, uh, they, they work his ears very strongly. Um, to Congressman Shimkus's uh, credit and uh, his uh, counterpart, uh, Congressman Flores, uh, who doesn't hold a uh, uh, he, he doesn't hold an administrative position within the, the subcommittee, but he's very active in trying to promote this legislation. So they held four hearings beginning in March, and uh, I think the last one was just before the Congress recessed at the end of July. Uh, Chairman Shimkus. Uh, concluded the hearing saying, well, uh, when we get back from recess after Labor Day, uh, we hope to start writing the bill. But um, the bill hasn't been written because we also had uh, the Supreme Court decision, we had any number of other scandals, and we have uh, President Trump's tweets uh, to, to deal with. So if it doesn't happen now, it possibly could happen in the lame duck session after the elections. Um, and if it doesn't happen in the lame duck sessions, uh, then um, it might happen right at the beginning uh, when uh, the new Congress is, is seated. Mm -hmm. But if none of this happens, um, uh, the automobile manufacturers uh, have said, we're in a tight spot. If you don't uh, bend the curve down, this, this, uh, this last phase that, uh, of, of the Obama administration's um, uh, revamping of the CAFE standards, then we have to go to very aggressive measures in order to comply with the statute, and that means electrification. If we're going to go to uh, 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 high fuel efficiency, no emission vehicles, then we have to go to electrification. Plug-in hybrids, uh, fully uh, electrified vehicles, some form of that in order to uh, gain compliance and not be in violation and not incur all the fines that the EPA would be in the Department of Transportation will be levying against so them. Let me, let me uh, 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 you know, try to restate what I think is happening here. And that is uh, we, we have the Obama very tough CAFE standards in the third phase of the CAFE standard increase that he set up. Right. Um, this committee um, could soften the third phase. It could soften the CAFE standards and thus uh, allow for a continuation of of fossil fuel in the American transportation market. If the, exactly. if the committee fails because of uh, you know, political considerations and delays and, and uh, possibly the midterms um, you know, uh, and nothing happens by the end of the year, uh, then we may see the, this effort, uh, I guess it's a Republican effort, um, you know, to soften the CAFE standards fail. And if it fails in order to comply with the statute, uh, which is the law, uh, right. they're going to have to go to electrification. And this is of some concern to the people who have to spend the money, make the investment to go to electrification. So exactly. am I right, am I right uh, Max, to think that this is p politically charged, that the Republicans oh, want to yeah. soften the EPA standards 
and the Democrats don't. They want Obama the way Obama set it up. Yeah. Um, yeah it's peculiar on the Democratic side. Um, uh, when I when I've watched the House hearings, because there's also a Senate counterpart to this, and there's activity um, in the trade associations trying to promote this bill. Uh, the uh, uh, refining interests are promoting this, and the automobile manufacturers are promoting this. Uh, the challenge is trying to uh, bring the the ethanol people to the table, certain constituencies within the ethanol table. But as far as the politics of it, um, the politics of it, you know. You, 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 see, you definitely see uh, Republicans interested in this, uh, and strong, more strongly interested in than dem Democratic politicians. In the case of the Democrats, it varies. There are some who um, are don't understand the economics, don't understand how costly the capital investment would be, and are fine with electrification. They don't. They also don't understand that you have to change the whole. Uh, uh, Effectively, the fueling system. You're, you're going to have to go to, uh, to some sort of massive recharging system for uh, those fully electric vehicles, um, and, and that um, impacts uh, the whole power generation situation. Mm -hmm. So, they're, they're, the way I would frame it is, coastal Democrats, certain coastal Democrats, and I've paid attention to one uh, in New Jersey who's in charge of the uh, the House Energy Committee, the ranking member. Um, he says, well, we're, good to, we're just, in his opening remarks, he always just says, well, we're just going to um, uh, electrification anyway, so we really don't need these hearings. But I'll make an opening statement anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you know, so, it, stri it strikes me that, um, you know, if, if the country, and it, it certainly isn't together on this, but if the country were together on this issue, um, and that means, um, you know, global climate change, um, and it means carbon uh, emissions and all that, um, then we would say we have to move to electrification as soon as possible. Let's not dawdle uh, with trying to preserve, um, you know, fossil fuel. Let's go there now. We know we have to pay a price. Everybody has to pay a price. And the issue is not, not so much whether we're going there, but who pays the price. Uh, right. And, and I, you know, so the question ultimately is, as it is in so many issues around environmental protection these days, is what is the administration's position? What is the EPA's position, and how much influence they have on this committee? Uh -huh. Well, the administration—they're—they're um, they're only paying attention to the corn farms. And there was recently, uh, a, in fact, in today's Wall Street Journal, there was uh, uh, Senator Grassley and Senator uh, Ernst from the state of Iowa uh, co-authored an op-ed commending um, the president. On his promotion of what's known as E15, 15% blends of ethanol and gasoline in the United States to be available, excuse me, to be available year round. Um, the the president doesn't have executive authority to implement this. The EPA is complying with the request, but it's it's a rulemaking process. Um, there's a lot of uh, they have to engage in in their own hearings uh, of of uh, of the regulated parties. Uh, the other problem is, is that uh, ca uh, California, California uh, carries a great deal of weight in this particular uh, discussion because um, it takes six years for California to authorize a new fuel, given this particular, uh, given what the waiver authority that, that was granted uh, initially under uh, the Clean Air Act back in. Um, in the 70s and, and 90s. You're talking um, about bureaucracy now. Bureaucracy, but also California, the way it tests fuel. Uh, the testing cycle actually takes six years. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they can't um, implement this. But I, I, I think I missed some part of your question. So, it, Well, it, I, you I know, be... I guess my question ultimately is this. Um, where are we going on this? You know, you have obviously lobbyist groups operating. Who have um, you know representing clientele around the country who will uh, benefit or or be be damaged by um, a change to electrification? Um, they have the possibility of electrification. A lot of interest groups would like to see that. You have the Republicans who are not particularly interested uh, in preserving the environment or issues around carbon emissions and climate change. Um, this is a really complex mixture. Of political winds and sweeping across right. the issue, 
Yeah. So my question, I, I'm not making this easy for you, Max. My question okay. is, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Um, I, uh, um, right now, from my vantage point, it looks as though America likes SUVs. Uh, <laughs> they like they like driving SUVs. Uh, while uh, you have political constituencies in the state of California, especially the governor, uh, who, who are more than eager to sign bills uh, to to <coughs> to implement lower lower carbon fuels or no carbon fuel, um, uh, you have automobile manufacturers that are concerned about investment, global platforms, selling uh, globally, things of that nature. And that would dearly love to uh, preserve the internal combustion engine. Um, you have a chairman like John S uh, Shimkus that wants to satisfy both his corn farming interests and his refining interests uh, in his particular district. So, um, but what's going to happen? My feeling is, if I if I heard uh, uh, the people at General Motors correctly, they're going to have to go through into some kind of uh, electrification. And then the problem is, how do you educate the consumer to buy their vehicles, meaning how do you market these vehicles, um, so that General Motors stays in compliance and still makes, is a commercially viable business. That's, that's, I, so I'm not answering your question as to what the future is going to look like. I'm just telling you what the problem is going to be. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure the midterm elections are going to have an effect on this too. Well, sure, absolutely. You know, I mean, given the uh, you know the polling, uh, Senate stays Republican. It looks as though on a generic ballot, the House flips. So if the House flips, then all the work that Chairman uh, Shimkus has done, along with the Congressman Flores, that just might be uh, dispensed with and pushed pushed off, unless uh, lobbying interests uh, can still keep this uh, uh, legislative activity alive going into the next Congress. Yeah, so you know what happened in the Judiciary Committee is the kind of thing is happening elsewhere. Um, the country is in this kind of situation right now, and it's, uh, it's it's not just in one area; it's in many areas. And as they say in China, we live in interesting times. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, Max uh, Pizier. Really appreciate you coming around for this discussion. And thank, uh, thank you all. Thank you also, and I look forward to the next time. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Hello, yes. <laughs>